It is beyond an honor and a privilege to be podcast interviewing Dr. Jack Dillenberg, everybody's role model and idol. Gosh, I have so many Jack Dillenberg stories, I don't even know where to begin. Let me, let me start with his autobiography. Dr. Jack Dillenberg is the inaugural dean of A.T. Still University, Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health. Now, I'm in Phoenix, and that's in Mesa, Arizona, just a suburb over a Mesa. Um, he completed his dental education at New York University College of Dentistry and received his master's degree in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. If I uh, applied to Harvard, they'd just send back an LOL. Yeah. They would just they thought I was joke. you. That's how they, I got they in. They think it was a typo. Previously, Dr. Dillenberg was associate director for public health programs in the California Department of Health Service. He also served in several capacities in the Arizona Department of Health Services, including being its director for four years. Dr. Dillenberg continues to serve in numerous leadership positions on health-related boards and associations and, and is the recipient of many honors and awards locally, nationally, and globally. But I want to say this. Um, in my generation... Probably 100% of everyone that graduated from a dental school, when it was over, it was like getting back from Vietnam. They kissed the ground. They were so glad it was over. Most people did not uh, uh, hurt their dean because it was illegal. Jack's the only dean I've ever met, and to some extent, Art Dagoni. Um, yes. Just you two are the only ones that come to mind, where all the students loved him. I mean, th this is a dean uh, where, I mean, you've Thank been you. the dean for Thank 15 you. years who... Um, always thought it was a great idea to invite all the students out to his house the night before school started to have beers and barbecue. I mean, I mean, he's approachable. He was hands on. You yeah. just, you, they were just your homies. Yes. And were. we, we came from a generation where they thought if I really loved you, I'm going to be like a Marine and I'm going to just break you down and build you up. Yeah. I think we works with Marines, but not doctors. And, and that's, that's um, that, that's, right. that's something that's changed in our lifetime. Absolutely. And do, do you think the how many dental schools around the world are on board with more what? and more are getting there i think one of the things i've learned with the uh, the asdo arizona school of dentistry and oral health experience is that we unlock something that was pretty special and i think what i'm finding is other schools are trying to emulate it it's difficult because they're built they've got clinics they've got commitments and so on and they've got faculty that are many are old school but i find that uh, some of the newer schools not all but some and some of the more traditional schools, like you mentioned, Art Dagoni, the Pacific, is humanistic. He started it. I learned from Art in that regard. And I think that there are a number of schools that are recognizing how important it is to nurture and grow healthcare providers. And, if, and I, one of my philosophies with my faculty is they've got to nurture and love their students into being good doctors. Then those students will love and nurture their patients. If they are assholes, if they are nasty, if they are bad to their students and rough to their students, obnoxious to the students, those students are going to treat their patients the same way. Nobody wins. And I think the key is it starts right at the very beginning. For us, it started with who we pick. I mean, I won't get into that now. We, we can talk about it if you like. But I think that's one of the defining things for us is who we pick to come to ASDO. Young men and women that have community service, have a heart. I can teach them the zzz, 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 zzz. That's the easy part of dentistry. The tough part of dentistry, I believe, looking back now after these years, is recognizing that you're a doctor recognizing that you are the trusted provider in this person's life, the person we call a patient, and they're going to come to you with things even beyond the stuff going on in their mouths. You know, I tell my students, for example, you know, you go to dental, many people go to dental school because they think, well, I'll just deal with the teeth. I mean, I do my cosmetic dentistry, do my veneers, take a weekend course, and all of a sudden I'm a guru on implants, whatever it may be. But the important thing they need to recognize is that they're doctors. And they may have a woman in the chair that this is the only person they could trust. And say, doctor, last night I went into my son's bedroom and I found drugs. What should I do? Doctor, yesterday my husband hit me. What should I do? We didn't go to dental school to think about handling those things. But the reality is you must. You are a doctor. It's not just being a tooth technician. It's being someone that is the trusted provider, the trusted confidant, very often, of the patients that we're honored to treat. So you put the student first so that you can put yeah. the patient first. Absolutely. 
And, and we do it in all sorts of ways, caring about them. The fact, we were the first dental school not to have tenure for faculty because I didn't want faculty just there doing the same old things all the time, uh, same tests, same questions, and, and feel like they could get away with stuff with the students and just be their own arrogant person if that's who they were. We wanted to have faculty that cared about the students, and it's worked. That's one of the things. You know, I, I say I'm the band leader of a world-class orchestra. I, I'm really good at picking the musicians. I think that's, and when, when you talk about leadership, I think that's really an important element, is being able to get good people around you, they'll make you look good. I get to pick some of the songs, I get to motivate them to play the concert of their lives, but they make the music. And I think a dental school without a faculty that is caring and committed is a, is a dental school that is uh, doing a disservice to the students that are there and ultimately the patients they serve and the whole healthcare system. Um, one, of the, one of the big complaints from dental schools for the beginning of time was that, like I remember when I was in dental school, if this instructor signed me in to do this and told me what he wanted, yeah. And then when I was done, I need a check. I don't care if he went to lunch and I had to wait an hour because I know if I went and got another instructor, he'd tell me it was all wrong and you know, yes. you had to get checked in and checked out, you know. Um, but I look on Dental Town. Two hundred and seventeen thousand dentists. They, they 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 you couldn't get them to agree that today is Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> how do you run a dental school when every dentist believes their own world and how do you how do you get all those big well. I don't want to say egos, but no, I, 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 mean, I was told this in yeah. MBA school that, you know, it's easy to have a large company if everybody's digging a ditch. But try to replace those ditch diggers with lawyers, physicians, or dentists, and you'll pull all your hair sure, out. Is that sure. why you're bald? That's why I'm bald. Well done. <laughs> you know, I had a full head of hair, and I was six foot three when I started this gig. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I think that's where you need team teaching as much as you need team learning you know, where the faculty collaborate together and work together for the patient's best interest. I remember years ago when I got out of dental school in 71, the prosthodontist did a survey. They sent out the same uh, case, the same models, the same Reader's Digest. Re yeah, well, the Reader's Digest picked it up, but it came from a, a dental, what's his name? I forget the guy wrote, uh, who, who wrote the article. But nonetheless. Do you still have it? No, I wish I had it. Okay. But what I remember is they sent it out to 100 prosthodontists. They got back 94 treatment plans. Same information on the patient. Oh my God, do you think it's on the internet somewhere? I don't know, but that's... Because uh, Reader's Digest said that with is 50. It, uh, there you go. It was, yeah. it was, and, and, and it really was an eye-opener for me and, and to recognize the art and science of dentistry. There are many ways to do things. And, and I'm not one to say, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm right, you're wrong. I think it's a matter of working together what's in the best interest of the patient and recognizing that there are options. And I think that that's one of the things, when I first started the school, people said, you know, because in the fourth year, we send our students away for 52% of the fourth year to community clinics throughout the United States. And we've got 65 sites, from Alaska to Maine to Florida, all over the place, Texas. And students go on five rotations in the fourth year. The, and I remember CODA in the beginning, they said, well, you can't do that. We have dental schools that have six, um, we are, you know, six sites in, in the same zip codes or five zip in, in the town and they can't manage it. You're going to go to all these sites and manage those with that. And so they did a focus site visit out to Arizona. First time they ever, CODA ever did that for this kind of rotation. They brought the experts from different schools that came and saw what we were doing. They came to Arizona, visited 18 sites. Drove all over the place, gone for three days. I remember Bruce Graham was the chair of it from University of Illinois, San, Chicago. And they went to visit the sites. I didn't know what they were seeing or doing. I just set up, call this person, go do it. They came back. After three days, we had our little meeting sitting around a table. I had my senior staff, you know, leadership team, their team, uh, my provost. And they said, and, and Bruce said, Dean Dillmer, we have to tell you something. I said, oh my God, now what? He says, you know, we came out here, we did this, 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 and this. We visited all these sites. We interviewed students, faculty, and patients. Everyone we met, this is almost a direct quote, was proud to be part of your dental school. And I have to tell you, we're proud to be here and witness this because we believe every dental school should be doing what you're doing with getting these students out of rotations. Not only do we have no recommendations, we're going to give you four commendations. 
This is new school. I mean, I'm crying. My staff is like, what? They never. They don't give accommodations on to the new school just starting out like that years ago. I mean, when we did this. And it was real interesting because when our students go on the rotation, you remember when you and I were in school, we saw two patients a day. Three would be a busy day. Our students see eight to 10, 12 patients a day. They're doing general dentistry, everything, flaps, implants with a one-on-one -on -one relationship with an adjunct faculty that we calibrate. Matter of fact, in two weeks, we've got our faculty advance. I didn't want to do retreats. What are retreats? You go backwards and circle the wagons. I wanted to do an advance where you go forward and be creative. So every year we do a faculty advance and I bring in all these providers from all these health centers and pay for them to come and calibrate them and teach them and hear their stories and our students learn from that. They're getting the confidence and competence. They come back from one of these rotations up in Essex. They want to go rural? I send them to Barrow, Alaska. There are 108 people live in Barrow, if you want to go rural, this, in, this ex Eskimo community up there. And, and they're learning and doing things. And it's, it's, it's tremendous. So other schools are trying to do that. And that was one of the important lessons I learned in terms of, one, you had to develop a really good clinically skilled graduate. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the credibility. But that was only part. I wanted the leadership thing. We were the, we still are. The first and only dental school that requires a public health certificate of every student before they graduate. They can roll it into a master's of public health, and many do, but that helps me feel comfortable that I'm giving them some skills to give them the broader view to help in their leadership within the community. And, and it's paying dividends. Big time, and I could tell you about that if you want to know. It's really pretty cool. Well, what's so funny, I, I hate to bring up anything negative, no, but- uh, go ahead. Any of your, uh, I always loved you the most because um, you were so focused on the poor um, yeah. resort, um, rural areas, yep. Indian reservations, um, areas that were in desperate need, whereas so much of dentistry is focused on going to North Scottsdale and Paradise Valley sure. and have a million dollar cosmetic practice. You were more worried about the the eighteen Undeserved. Indian reservations yes. and public health and and your detractors used to always call you some liberal New York socialist hippie and whenever they'd say that it, like it, that too. I would think well that's a compliment <laughs> I know, no, I know, I know, I that's a compliment I if that's the meanest thing you can say about Jack I mean might as well just I'm give him an Eagle Scout yeah. um, another um, complaint or, or comment um, that sure. dental students have said over the years is that they um, they wanted a mix of full-time faculty and part-time faculty because they believed in a romantic notion that like some of your students like uh, teachers like say Tim Taylor if he's down there practicing in the real world four days a week and he's down there on Friday they feel like that's a connection with the outside world do you, do you still think dental schools should have a mix with because sometimes full time faculty are, are, are we've got critique that they're in the ivory tower yeah, and they, yeah. they lose touch with reality. Do you think all dental schools should have a mix of full time and part time? That's my thought. You know what I mean? Every school needs to do what they need to do, and I'm not here to tell. I never tell anyone what they have to do and stuff. I may if they ask me my opinion, I'll give it or give a suggestion. I believe it should be a mix, um, and we have that mix of, of full time and part time. I've got about. 70, 60 full time and about 100 part time, 110 part time. Say those numbers again. I think it's about 60, 70 full time and about just over 100 part time. And, and again, it varies. Uh, I think that part, one of the things too that a lot of schools don't require is clinical experience with special needs patients, the intellectually and developmentally disabled. We're getting more and more students with uh, patients with autism with other mental and developmental disabilities that need care. And if they don't get, if dentists don't have the confidence and experience in dental school, they'll be, if someone comes in the road, oh, no, no, I can't take care. We gotta send you to a pediatric dentist or send you to someone who does anesthesia or whatever it may be. And, and that's not acceptable. You mentioned about the Indians, that was the reservations. That was a big deal for me when I st to go, started this journey in, in, in ASDO. Back then, there were only 98 American Indian dentists in the whole United States out of 150,000 dentists, 140,000. I said, you talk about an underrepresented minority. There's an underrepresented minority. And as you, we had 22 sovereign nations just in Arizona. 
So I took it upon myself to say, we want to make a difference. And I called, you know, George Blue Spruce, the first American Indian to graduate from the U.S. school. Can you deliver him to me for a podcast? I wanted to podcast him so bad. Well, we'll see. I don't know. His travel is limited, but... He's a great oh, guy. I'll yeah, drive, I'll drive up to the see him. The surprise. He's in surprise. I'll drive a surprise. Yeah, he's he's, he's special. Ryan, will you drive me to surprise? Yeah, George is, is he'd love that, and he is extraordinary. We've known each other since 1970, when I was a senior dental student. We met when he was working at the federal government in Washington. I was down. He was this young, independent, radical sort of guy, and I was the old hippie. And we blah blah blah. We <laughs> did, we were conniving back then. And then um, when I was the health director and he was the assistant surgeon general out here in the Western region, uh, we reconnected again. And then when I started the dental school, I called him up. I said, George, we need to do something about this. And he was so excited he could hardly stand it. And he's my associate dean for American Indian Affairs. He helps in the recruitment, retention and, uh, for these young men and women. And we have educated more American Indian dentists than anybody. You know, in one class, we have... We had six in one class one year. And every one of our American Indian graduates has returned to the Indi- an Indian community to practice. In that class of six, all six were women, which is pretty amazing, which was very, mo- that was a powerful thing for me to believe uh, and be proud of. You know, we, we, we trained the first Oneonta dentist. We trained the first uh, Chippewa dentist. We, I mean, all these different, you know, Navajo, they were about the 12th or 13th dentist. But we're still doing it. We, you know, in one year, eight, dental, eight American Indians applied to dental school in the United States. Four came to our school. So we've, ma- we've done that. We've started the first student, student uh, uh, society for American Indian dentists is in our campus. You know, we've done these things, and we've done the global stuff, too, because I believe health care is bigger than just the health. To me, it's linked to peace, and that excites me, that we can play a role in making this a better place. I happen to be in Jerusalem where I visited Hebrew University at the celebration. They were inaugurating their Tree of Peace, donated by Alan Finkelstein in New York to honor his family, but it commemorated the collaboration between the Hebrew University Israeli dental students and the El Quds Palestinian dental school and all the Palestinian dental students working together on collaborative projects with the poor to show that you can have peace and collaboration among people of different religions and political beliefs. So here you had the Israeli dental students and the Palestinian dental students working together and they put up this tree of, I just said, wow, this is too, I said, who did this? And it was a woman, Head Verserf, famous sculptors from Paris. I said, how much does one of these babies cost? He said, blah, 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 blah. I said, fine, thanks, give me your card. Came back to the States, in six weeks I raised the money I called her up. I said, can I get one of you? What do you need to get started? I said, send her $10,000. Have we have the first tree of peace in the United States on our campus to do that, to commemorate this, that. You can't have health without peace, and you can't have peace without health. It's, it's a given. And what's really cool, now Harvard University has a tree of peace. Now Temple University has a tree of peace. Other dental schools are looking at doing it, but our little school, Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health, first in the United States. You know another interesting thing about Israel and, and Arizona Indian Reservations? Did you realize those Joshua trees? Oh, Joshua trees, yeah. Are sure. only found right here in Arizona and in Israel. That's wild. No, I, I love Joshua trees. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? No, that's wild. I had no and, idea. And, had no and, idea. The, and the park ranger guy told me that no one has a clue or an idea of how it happened. Um, so the average dean... Um, serves five years the average you were inaugural dean you started the dean yeah. averages four years you made it 15 years yeah i need therapy <laughs> <laughs> i need some serious that, counseling how did you do that was it jameson whiskey yeah, was it yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. how did you last 15 years because of my students and the faculty it is a family environment i it's not i tell my students it's only work if i'd rather be doing something else i go there every definition. you know what i mean it's because the joy that's there. You ask anyone who's visited our school from around the country, a dentist, a dean, they say, I've never seen anything like this. 
I don't care who it is, whether it be from industry, from a distributor to a manufacturer to a dental school. I've had de dental school deans out and they say, wow, I've never seen a culture like this where it's supportive, non-competitive. At our white coat ceremony, the first day of school, I say the competition stops now. You competed to get in. And they do. We have 2,600 applicants for 76 spots. We're number one in the United States for number of applicants per seat of any dental school. So the, the students out there know about it, know and get it. So it's hard to get into our school. They and just want an easy hippie deal. They want a hippie deal. It's not so easy. <laughs> our, trust me, our modular basic <laughs> science is as tough as it gets. And, but they want to be at a place where they can flourish. And we've had children of famous people come. I mean, dean, children of deans come to our school. Children, uh, uh, Arthur Goni's niece came to our school. The Walter Cohn's fan, uh, niece or something came to our school. We get people that come to our school. Linda Neeson, the dean of Nova Southeast, and her son graduated from our school. I mean, we get people, they get it. They get it. And what I love about it is that culture that, um, that exists there. This caring, compassion, helping, and that non-competitive. And, and we have the data to show it. Last year's graduating class, 36 graduates applied to residencies. 35 matched their first choice. Nobody does that. It's insane. In the 10 years of graduating classes, we have produced 60 pediatric dentists. So you got 10 graduating classes. That's an average of six a year when you're graduating starting with 54 and you're up to 76. 60 pediatric dentists and 19 maxillofacial surgeons. For a dental school in Mesa, Arizona, that only has a maximum of 76 students. It's, it's insane. You are, you are so loved and so adorable. You're also the only dean of a dental school I've ever heard of that actually gave commencement graduation speeches yes. at another dental school. Twice no. now. Nobody does that. Nobody how, does. how do you get a competing dental school to know. invite the dean of another dental school it, to give their graduation it's pretty commencement wild. speech? It, well, it, that's how much you're Yeah, loved no, and, and I thank you. Thanks, Howard. I appreciate it. You know, I did University of Detroit Mercy, and just this June, I, 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 did, uh, I got a call from John Featherstone, one of the most famous, the most famous dental researcher. They get more NIH research money than any dental school in America. <laughs> University of California, San Francisco, the top big school. And he called, he called me up and said, Jack, I'd be honored if you'd come out and be our commencement speaker this year because I w we have good researchers, we produce good data, but I want them to know your message because I love your message and what you talk about. So I went out to UCSF this June to give the commencement address. And it was, I gotta tell you, it was moving for me. It was, I, I, I had 1,200 people in the audience, the students, the graduates, so on. On the stage behind me, I had 150 faculty in the gowns and everything. And I wanted to do a good job. I really did, because I, I appreciate John, and, and I was honored to do it. So I'm on stage, and I'm giving this thing about leadership, about what it is to be a doctor, what it is, you know, integrity, how important integrity is the, the cornerstone of, of any health profession. And I went on and on, I finished. I stepped back from the podium, and I just glance over my shoulder, I'm in the gown. All of a sudden, the entire faculty jumps to its feet and gives me a standing ovation. Wild. I turn over to uh, Dave Lowenstein, who was, who was just sitting next to me. He's the chancellor of the whole university system. I said, David, what's up? He says, Jack, I've attended close to 20 of these things. I've never seen a faculty stand and give a speaker a standing ovation. And we've had some pretty good ones. That was pretty wild. I'm, I'm emotional, you know me, you know. And it was, I still hear about it. I ran into John at the Canberra meeting, and, and Kyle, he said, John, you know, Jack, I gotta tell you, they're still talking about your remarks and blah, blah, blah. And for me, as an old fart, it's just, it's great that I can still, you know, have the opportunity to motivate, to inspire, to help make things better. And if I can get these faculty members excited, you know, engaged with this good feeling with the students, hey man, it's a great day. I thought I got a standing ovation one time, and then I realized I was just so short. They were, they were all, <laughs> That's what I usually they experience. They were all sitting. Um, Jack, you mentioned that of the, did you say the first eight um, Native American Indian graduates were women? No, in one class. Oh, in one class. In one class, we had six, which was the largest number to ever, one, largest cohort in any class ever of American Indians, and all six were women. Okay, six women. So six I out wanna, of. I wanna ask that, in your graduating class, one. Um, one woman. One woman. 
Um, no, and, and the only minority person we had was Reg Louie, Asian young man from San Francisco. So um, a lot of people, uh, so that's one of the biggest changes we've seen in dentistry. Yes. I mean, some people say the biggest change of the 80s was dental materials. Some say the 2000s, it was dental technology. I'd go back and say the biggest change in dentistry was it was from an all-male profession. Yes to half women sure is, and is it, your is your school half women now? yes uh last year's class was more women than men this year's class uh, last year's entry class was more women than men this year's is about exactly 50 50. So last year was that the first class we had more women than men yes but they were they've all they've always been close to you know yeah 48 so, so i want to ask you so yeah. does does going from all men with one woman in your class to half women does that change dentistry I think it makes it more caring and compassionate. Women are generally more compassionate, more Absolutely. caring, nurturing. They're mothers. They know. They, I mean, this is. I don't know whether it's DNA or it has oh, to be. It's it has you know, to has, be. They're they're more caring they have in many ways. Instincts. I mean, yes. biologists agree. No with question. That. About it. You know, and, and for a while there were a lot of people worried. Oh, we got more women. They're not going to practice as much. They're not going to this. Who cares? The quality of the practice is going to be that much better, and it's okay. You know, in Europe. Years ago, I do a lot of it global, like you know, as you know, and like you. And over there, nine, years ago, I remember when I checked on it the first time, 98% of the dentists were women, 2% were men, because they were mainly Where? around the globe in the old days. Because they, there was government. There was no money. There was no money. Like it teaching was, in America. Yeah, and I said, it was no money. There's no money. Well, here it was the other way around. There was 80, you know. Because there's money. Because there's money. And I think it's just interesting to see that dynamic. And now, I'm just excited that women are getting into it. And I'm excited to see, too, the career growth from dental hygiene into uh, dentistry. you got a lot of dental. dental we, we have in our cl students that we've taken that were former dental assistants, former dental hygienists, um, all sorts. And I, it, but don't you think a dental hygiene degree would be the ultimate undergraduate degree for dental school? Uh, I mean, if you graduate, well, it if could you go, be if you go to undergrad and get a degree in biology, chemistry, math, and physics. Yeah, you're working at Burger King. Yeah. through dental school. Yeah, but when I was in school, almost all the women in my class were the hygienists hygienist. first, and they'd go work Saturday. Back in that day, it was you know sure, a twenty dollar sure. an hour sure. job while I was working at Walgreens for three dollars. <laughs> yes, no, I think it's a great one, and I and I like hygienists. Hygienists. Uh, you know, we, you know, one of the things that we, they did a little survey at our school, we have the highest number of dental hygienists on a dental school faculty that doesn't have a hygiene school. All, our hygienists teach non-surgical perio, they teach, you know, the injection techniques to transition from sim clinic to clinic. Our hygienists are rock stars. Yeah, you stole one of mine. I'm still sad. Man. <laughs> Corey, remember well, Corey? Corey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I love our hygienist. They're one just one of the greatest phenomenal. hygienists I ever had. And and she, her and her mom went and worked for wow. you. Wow. And I love the fact that dental hygienists, to me, are the best health educators in the health business, and and they're underutilized. And it's not the dentist's fault. It has to go back. You know, we talked this a, year, a while back. You know, reimbursement. You know, if insurance companies pay a dental office to do tobacco cessation, do nutrition counseling, bam, you've got a hygienist there that is really the best at it and can do it. We just need to get a reimbursed. The dentist can bill for it. And I'm working on that because I think that's the future. Well, let, let's go into some more controversial things. Sure. Dentistry Uncensored. Um, in my 30 years, I mean, I've heard more crazy drama about hygienists, you know, dentists trying to prevent hygienists from independent licensures, independent yeah. practices. Even when the evidence is like in Colorado where they've legalized this for decades. Six of them? There's yeah. six. Yeah, it's crazy. But with the noise, you think we'd be, we're would be being invaded by aliens. The other thing I, I couldn't figure out is uh, dental therapists. Yeah. They would show areas in Alaska, areas that were bigger than like the state of, you know, uh, yeah, Rhode, Island. Uh, Rhode Island without one dentist. And then they talk about some therapist getting on a snowmobile to go treat some Eskimos, and you literally think, I mean, uh, the, the yep. dentist just went insane. Yeah. Why, why, is, why, is, why is access to care to poor people so controversial to dentists? Well, I think because they're, they're probably afraid that they're going to do, be independent and take their cash and insurance paying patients away, which I, I don't believe that for a second. You know, to me, and plus, there's no way they'll ever be independent practice. I think a middle level provider, whatever you want to call it, whether it be a therapist or whomever, 
uh, linked with a dentist is going to be a tremendous add-on. The dentist will always be the leader of the oral health industry. The dentist will run the show. These mid-levels will work for them. I mean, back in the 60s, dentists were opposed to hygienists. So we don't need hygienists. I'll do the cleanings. Really? Right. You know what I mean? Silly. It's just like physicians were opposed to physician assistants. You know, and now you can't go to a physician's office without seeing the PA first to do the preliminary exam or, or, or things. I think, and now in Arizona, they just passed the sunrise. They, so we're going to see, we're going to see it now in Arizona on the reds. We're going to see mid-levels here. What, what, what just passed in Arizona? I, I, I know you just started the expanded duty. Yes. The expanded function, function duty assistant. Well, Pivotal Consulting, representing, I think, Pew or one of the group, filed a a petition to the legislature this week to for a sunrise legislation to create a scope of practice and create the oral health profession of a mid-level provider the dental health for arizona I, I missed that it happened just yes that? this week check huh. out this week just the other day what day thursday or maybe tuesday and it was on espn no espn there you go it was the game of the week wasn't <laughs> was barkley talking about week? that Huh. Can, yeah. can you email me any information on that? I'll see what or, I'll, or, or, it's on, or, or, what's Ryan his name? Kevin Earls, Earls got it. it, it he said, Kevin Earls sent out a thing to the, ADA, to the Arizona ADA folks on the Sunrise uh, filing for dental health therapists in Arizona. Arizona Sunrise. Sunrise legislation. Sunrise legislation. And you can check with for the, dental health, yeah. For dental and the therapists. State Dental Association is going to oppose it, you know, just because they are. But they want to do it initially for um, uh, the reservation. Hi, that's very sweet. This is the only woman that will live with me. This is the only woman that would come yeah, up and pay yeah, me too, some attention. Too tried, but too tried, uh, no. now that's I'm, why my wife and I don't live together. That's <laughs> what makes it work. <laughs> this is the uh, so uh, well, we of course they're going to oppose it. I remember Jack fifteen years ago when you tried to open up a dental school. I thought you were trying to open up a nuclear power. I know, plant. wasn't that amazing? The, the I mean, negativity. And, and your biggest, your biggest was detractors the, was, the was the was the Arizona State the, Dental Association, yes. and they would talk about uh, the first mm -hmm. dental school in Arizona, and I was sitting there like, well, where did you go? Did did you not go to a dental school? Yeah. You had more arrows in, in your my back. Butt, I was, it was amazing. Opening, you opened up the first dental school in Arizona in a state that was more redneck hillbilly yes, yep. than I mean we make Texas look yeah, liberal. Yeah, and they lied. Was, was that hard on you personally? Oh God, yes. And they would say things and print things in incidentals, their I magazine, know. saying that Dillenberg is doing this. He's the guy who invented managed care. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, and that they wanted, and that it was going to be a virtual school. They won't have a clinic, and they said we wouldn't I have know. a clinic. I, I said, know. how can a dental association say that? And it took me years to, to. I had dentists around the state when I tried. I said, you're the guy start. You started the school with no clinic. I said, what are you talking about? I know. Girl, I, I felt sorry for you. Dude. It was it was good. I told you I was I a lot mean, taller than. <laughs> look I at mean, me! I'm 39 really, years really, old. Really, you are a role model for me. I'm a 39 year. Look at this. I don't think I've ever had an air on my back that when it hit, I thought, man, that would have bounced off Jack. Oh yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah. But anyway, it was all great. It worked out great. Yeah. Now they're my de best friends, and the same. With, I had well, the same problem with Delta. Under new management. Yeah, yeah. Same with Delta. Delta when the uh, Griego, those guys, blah blah blah, were doing it. It was. You know, when you retire from uh, your dean, dean next mm -hmm. year, you, so next year, what, so it would be May? June 30th. June 30th, 2007. You know, you know one door, I think only, um, when I think of an ambassador in dentistry that could yeah. walk into any realm of dentistry, I, I only think of you. I don't know who else it would be. But, you know, like, um, when you talk to, like, the um, the head economist of the um, oh, American Dental yeah, Association, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he wants... You know, Delta has hundreds of millions of claims, and they just want to see things like what lasts longer, a filling, a, a resin, or an amalgam, or, or on endo teeth, which ones, last? and they can't even get a return phone call from any insurance company to give them data because there's just no trust. Yeah, there there yeah, used yeah. to be, because when you opened up a dental school, there was no trust with yep, yep. your own dental site. Do you think you could ever open doors between the sure, head economist I, of. of I, uh, I had him in a meeting on, on Medicare, and I had people from United there and, and DentaQuest there at the table to talk about uh, oral health and Medicare, which is something I really want to achieve while I'm still alive. And I think, you know, trust is an important thing. You know, I tell that to my students all the time. I said, nothing is more important than your integrity, your honesty. I don't give a hoot 
how good uh, you are with your hands. It doesn't matter. If you lie, cheat, or steal, you're undermining our profession. And nothing is more sacred in, you know, than that. Because you can't even get dentists to agree on what lasts longer in amalgam yeah. or composite. Yeah, who cares? Just and United the... Concordia, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have all the answers yeah. yep. that an economist could take that data yep. Yep. and in literally a yep. week yep. tell you the exact answer. Yes. But we can't get access, you know, the profession. Those to camps that. won't talk to each other. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a shame. Well... You know, let's see what I can do. When I, my next step, I really want to get back re-engaged in public health. You know, I, as you know, I'm a public health guy that happens to be a dentist. You, um, you all, you're well. I wouldn't call you a public health. I'd just call you a pioneer because you pioneer everything from public health, government, dental schools. You're even hot on this uh, silver diamine fluoride, which yeah. is which is controversial too. Yeah. What What are your thoughts on that? And how did you I get think, interested in that? You know, I. I Canberra, you know, I think we're trying to institute the Canberra, you know, carries management by risk assessment, which I think makes a lot of sense. It takes a little time, but I've met a number of dentists that have integrated it into their offices and make it work. And again, it's prevention. It's, it's what we need to do. We've got two diseases besides oral cancer. We've got caries and perio, and we haven't controlled either one. It's a, it's, it's a crime. Caries we can do. I've seen case and, and evidence-based research that where they put the silver diamine fluoride on a tooth, the decay stops, no recurrent decay anywhere. On a case after case on with history, with brothers, sisters, and so on. Yes, it does cause a black stain. And it was interesting trying speaking to some of the moms about this, and they would say, I don't care if its tooth is black, as long as the child's not in pain, I don't have to bring him in for injections, especially if it's a deciduous tooth. Oh my God, let that deciduous tooth now be caries free so that it'll stay the amount of time that it has to. It forms the right pathway for the permanent tooth, so you don't need orthodontics. The swallowing works, the, all the, you know what I mean? The, the development goes better in the oral cavity. And then even on a permanent tooth, so what? There are cultures that they paint their teeth black and put white dots on them just because it's cool. Look at how people run around with the with their the, the, the stars on their front teeth or whatever it is. I don't think it's an issue, especially when you ask the moms. I was at the Canberra meeting in Denver three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and it was amazing to see some of the research and listen to some of the dentists speak about how they thought they wouldn't be successful. And man, they're, they're just all over it. So I think the dentists that are watching this, if you want to, you know, it's... Look at the silver diamine fluoride. Look at the opportunity for that. It's an off-label use. So is fluoride varnish. Fluoride varnish is considered a desensitizer, and we use it to prevent tooth decay. It's not approved by FDA for tooth decay, but these, same thing with the silver diamine fluoride. It's approved for desensitization, not for caries prevention, but it works. works better than anything that I've seen or presented to me from evidence-based material. And we just had an Arizona high, um, pediatric dentist, uh, Jeannie make the cover of the new york times with that talking about that i love it so yeah. i think you, you know your dentists that are, are watching this need to take a moment look at it see what opportunities there may be and and, and i like i said if they just sit down with the moms of these kids i think they'll get they'll, they'll get a different perspective jack how do you how do you uh find the inner strength to hold course I, i've seen you um twice in a water floor days campaign 89 and just last year 2015. i mean when both of those uh times uh, uh, you got it floor dated in phoenix in 1989 and you went before you know the whole media circus and then you had and then i think it expired after 20 years yeah. and i just you did it again i mean there were people out there that literally thought you were a communist plot <laughs> that you're pouring poison in their water and they're saying you know get the government out of my water um, how do you, how do you, what, what are your views on water fluoridation after you've gone through yeah. two wars? It works. It works. I think, you know, water fluoridation is great. It's not the only solution. I think uh, that's where I think there are opportunities uh, for other things. It's a great advantage to have the fluoride in your water. It's a great advantage to have a little bit of fluoride in your toothpaste to have it work. I think the silver diamine fluoride is a good option for some things. You know, to me, brushing and flossing is always there. This nonsense about the flossing that's emerged in a, a few months ago, I think is just that, nonsense. I think, you know, flossing works. You go and have a sesame seed bagel and you don't floss, you're going to be having sesame seeds in your teeth for a long, long time. So it does work. You know, I think that there certainly could be more research on it, and people just didn't research it so much. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work. 
And I think with the fluoride, I think fluoride is, 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 is acceptable, it works, it's safe, I got no problem with it. Um, but I think we need to really explore the other stuff. What bothers me is the, the lack of uh, emphasis on periodontal disease, whether it be the use of soft tissue lasers, whether it be the oral hygiene, you know, the inflammatory process that occurs in, in between teeth and the sulcus uh, has a profound effect, I believe, on overall health, and we need to be concerned about that. I think the associations that have been identified between periodontal disease and heart disease, stroke, um, preterm delivery, other things, is, is clear and real, and I think is going to get more uh, evidence behind it as time goes on. So we really need to pay attention to that, and we can. You know, I found we take care of a lot of special uh, needs patients and medically complex. We work with uh, a facility where there are people in comas and, and really ill, and they don't get out, and their whole dental plan is just a toothbrush. And we go in there and, and or bring them in and, and, and do procedures, whether it be the soft tissue laser, something that is going to make a difference. But I think ultimately, whether it be the use of fluoride in the water, whether it be use of other in interventions, we need to have an interprofessional, interdisciplinary environment. I encourage, you know, and that's revolutionary. You know, dentists have always had the privilege of putting up their shingle and doing the solo practice. Well, to me, you know, that's going the way of the, the buggy whip. The guy who made the last buggy whip was probably the best buggy whip maker in the United States when Henry Ford is rolling out Model Ts. That's what's going to happen now. Dentists out there need to get more engaged in the interprofessional environment, collaborating with the physicians in their community, the PAs, the nurse practitioners, the behavioral health people, uh, physical therapists. That's critically important, and I think they have to get more engaged in the social media digital technology, whether it be apps like text to floss ph to oh There are some wonderful uh, opportunities to get your patients engaged. There's a great one in San Francisco that... Um, Can you uh, find those two apps for me yeah. and email them to me? Genie MD plus OH. Genie MD plus OH. Genie, like I dream of Genie? Yeah, I dream of Genie. G-E-N-I. M-D plus OH. The plus sign or Plus sign, plus sign, OH. This is a guy in San Francisco developed it using Watson, Watson the technology and Harvard Medical School for data, uh, for the information, evidence-based material. And what he's done is set up a, an app that you download, and now you, you, you add to it your dental provider, your medical provider, your behavioral health provider, your allergist, whoever you want. They're able to communicate through this environment on in a HIPAA compliant way, and you control that. It also works on, uh, you, if you have a grandparent or a parent that's up in Minnesota that you want to help monitor their care, they're in assisted living, you do it for them. You get their providers on there, and you're able to interact with the grandma's provider up there in this uh, care network. It's patient-centric. That's what I love about it. It makes the patient in charge. And I'm so impressed with this. Uh, I think it's a couple of, I don't know what it costs. Companies give it to, the, a lot of companies are giving it to their employees. I think Walg, one of the, I don't know whether it's CVS, one of them gives it to employees so that they're able to monitor their own health and, and be in charge. It gets all their records on there. It gets their providers on there, data on there, whatever it is. Genie MD plus OH. And the other one was text, text to, floss. to floss. T-E-X-T, number two, floss. Now go on, and it's .com, they got a website, and they've got a free app that is, what I love about it for your phone, it's English, Spanish, German, Arabic. So it's available globally. Um, we English? Sp English, Spanish, German, and Arabic. So it's available for all sorts of uh, cultures. And what it is, it's interactive text messaging between the dental office and the patient. It asks the, the patient signs up if they want to do it. Then the office sends out, it, it automatically sends out a deck. Did you floss yesterday? Yes or no? And then it sends them a health message. And they sign up in a category, whether it be an adult, a mother with children zero to five, over 60 or a teenager and and th the message is geared for that population and it on the on the website it's got all ADA approved uh, evidence-based uh, information 
It's a fabulous one, Text to Floss. So take a look at that. Um, I want to ask you about some um, other sure. um, nightmarish public health services. Um, I, I um, a lot of people retire to Arizona. There's a lot of nursing homes. I, I've gone to about nine different nursing homes um, after work. Sometimes it was uh, 12 o'clock at night. And everybody in those nursing homes will tell you that when you put grandma in a nursing home, she's going to get one root surface cavity a month. So after she's been in there a yeah. year and a half, she has 18 teeth turning to mush. It's one of the biggest silent dental epidemics in dentistry. That's where silver diamine fluoride could be great. You could go in there and just put it on your finger and rub it on the teeth and the caries goes away and won't come back. Really? Really. Really? Yeah. There needs to be a whole lot more of that. Yes. And I don't, and I want to ask you that my I I'll tell you the the thing that grinds my gears the most. The two issues that grinds my gears the most. We have a country where every year 8,000 to 38,000 people die of the flu. And you look at their last point of entry into the healthcare system. Why aren't we doing the vaccinations? Dentistry I agree. is usually first, second or third. I can go to Walgreens and have a pharmacy tech give me yep. a flu shot. I can go to the grocery store and have a tech, but I got a doctor in dental surgery and my hygienist has four years college registration and she can't give a flu shot. It's insane. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. I agree with you hundred percent. I don't get it. Same with HPV. HPV. That's another That's one. That's our cancer. Yes. And I can get an HPV yes. shot at Walgreens, but I legally would lose my license if I did in Arizona. It's, it makes no sense. So what, what should all my homies do? Well, I think they got to get in touch with their elected officials. Simple as that. Say, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't I think we? That should be your first project. After well, that could retire. be a good one. Well, <laughs> I'll put it on. It's right there. I, gotta, I can I have a number. I have a series of number ones. My God, you hey. go to Delta, get the I know. information, then I know. flu shots. Isn't HD. that amazing that we can do all these things and then, like I say, can take a weekend course in implants and become an expert and do an implant on Monday? Go to a course Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, they're doing implants, but they can't give an injection. Makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, it's just sad because um, I've seen it in my own practice sure. where you wonder where, how come Ethel didn't come back in her six-month recall, and then you find out she, well, she died of the flu. And you're thinking, it's, I uh, saw her three weeks before ridiculous. she died of the flu. What about, what about the, we have an oral test for HIV. Dentists don't want to do it. So, so then let, so, so let's talk about that. So, so you said um, we, we treat caries. We treat uh, caries disease, periodontal disease. Yes. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on occlusal disease? Some people claim dental schools don't teach enough about TMJ, TMD, occlusal disease. We do pretty good. Yeah, we do pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> you know, that's the thing. Every You've seen one dental school, you've seen one dental school. You know, a lot of the schools have the influence of the dean based on their experience and then who's in there as department chairs and so on. Um, I think occlusal disease is important. I mean, I, the only graduate program that I have besides the AEGD, the Advanced Education General Dentistry, is orthodontics. I don't have perio, endo, surgery, be, pros, because I want to produce a super dentist that can do all of those things. A traditional dental school that has those graduate programs, they're doing those cases. They're doing the molar endo. You know, there are students graduating dental school that have done one endo the whole yeah. four years, and it's an anterior tooth. Oh, yeah. I say, what, are you kidding me? Insane. But I think certainly the, the, to be able to diagnose the potential for uh, some of this uh, oral facial stuff, the pain, needs to be there. We have a pain center. We have a sleep center. So we're doing some of these things. I've got some great people working that in our school. We focused on our residents primarily, but we have a program now where we have our fourth-year students side-by-side -side with our AGD residents on these cases. So, I want to go back to women in dentistry. Certainly. Um, you know, it seems like um, where America is number one economic, it's, uh, it's all men. It's uh, military, medicine, um, insurance, banking, finance, music, and movies. I mean, you know, that's yeah. what America is number one in. It seems like whenever you go into an industry where there's no money, like education, it's all women. When, you go, when I go to countries where they're poor, the dentists are all women. Where I go to countries where it's rich, you know, I'm talking course, 20 years sure, ago, it's sure. all men. But anyway, long story short, <clears throat> oh, um, all the men in this profession, they always want to talk about uh, the explosion of dental materials, doing the cosmetic revolution, re replacing amalgams and gold with, you know, porcelain and tooth color. Yeah. And now they're 
retiring uh, 10,000 people per day, 10,000 baby boomers a day are retiring. So now they're all into surgical implants and all this. But there was this another big macroeconomic forces. Obamacare uh, said that um, medical insurance for kids had to cover dental. So the data is out there that you know another 10 million kids are covered. And um, the millennials um, dropped in 2007 had 4.7 million babies. So when you look at the macroeconomic, Pediatric dentistry is exploding. Yes. Yet this country with 330 million people don't even graduate 330 pediatric dentists a year. So the, the country only graduates one pediatric dentist per million population when Obamacare, follow the money, just insured another 10 million. But my question is this. Our generation, the men, the last thing they want to do is treat kids. A kid. yeah. Do you think now that the classes are half women, that yes. more women will yes. treat children? Uh, you can see it here in Arizona. Go to the P Arizona Pediatric Dental Society. 80% of women now. Used to be the guys. I remember when I first came out here and it was dental director at the health department, it was all guys. There was no women. And that's what I've been saying for a couple of years that um, um, when I was little, all OBGYNs were men. Yeah. Now they're all women. Do you yeah. think pediatric dentistry will be the first specialty that yes. goes pretty much all women? Yes. Not all, but predominant. Yes. Yeah. We, over, com, overwhelming majority. I agree with you 100%. I haven't met a male pediatric dentist graduate in years. They're not graduate in years. We have a few, um, but it's primarily women. Primar yes, and that's great. Whatever it is, you know, to me, it's, uh, you know, the pediatric dentist can't see all the children. And I think I, I learned that when I was in leadership in the health department in, in California. We passed some legislation that if dentists, general dentists, took some a little advanced training or certificate course in children, they could bill for uh, children's dental because they, we didn't have enough pediatric dentists in California, so we allowed general dentists with a little advanced training um, to see children and bill for it. You were also, the Arizona Department of Health and Human Services, the director was always an MD. You were the first dentist director of that, is yes. that true? Uh, yeah, I'm only the, in the whole United States, I'm only the second dentist to ever be director of a state health department. That's amazing because you're not even a real doctor. I'm not even a real doctor. <laughs> I'm not even tall. I mean, it's a, you know, and it's it was pretty amazing. It was the whole. I want I want to ask you another uh, macroeconomic uh, um, sure question out here in Arizona. Um, the your dental school you made it a DMD. Yes. And I'm a DDS. So am I. Which is actually the only real dentist. I mean, seriously, because if you go to Microsoft Outlook. And I enter Howard Fran DDS, it enters at Fran, comma, Howard. If I enter Howard Fran DMD, it'll enter at DMD, comma, Howard Fran. So if Microsoft doesn't even recognize DMD. That's why I have an Apple. <laughs> I have an Apple. <laughs> no, but my question is, I feel sorry for the consumer because I, yeah. I, they, they've asked me for 30 years, um, Howard, what's the difference? This doctor's an MD, this sure. is a DO, sure. this is a DC. And they'll say to me, well, my daughter, she was having problems with her filling, but she, the dentist wasn't a DDS like you. They were a DMD. Is that a real dentist? Or do, do you think that um, if we put the customer first, the patient, that the 56 dental schools ought to say pick one? And, and because there's no really differentiating factor is there between a DDS and a DMD? There is no differentiating but all, factor. But the last seven new dental schools were all DMD. Yes, says because I think we're going, it speaks to going to the whole person healthcare involvement. Doctors and medical, you know, it, 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 and I think, you know, before when a doctor of dental surgery it was all exodontia. Most dentistry was exodontia. Ruge, endo wasn't around when dentistry started. Fillings were barely, it was mainly pulling teeth. So it's it was doctor the surgery of dental surgery to yeah, doctor of de medical uh, uh, dentistry. Doctor of medical dentistry. Yeah. And I think now and what that does, it is moving it's helping to move the profession along to this more whole person health care, which is what, what we need. It's not just surgery, it's not pulling teeth, we're saving teeth. In those days when we are, when our we started, it was all about extractions. It was surgical. I, that's that's well because I I, I I think on the can I mean the, 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 my favorite examples are remote control versus the iPhone the remote yeah. control I've never gone in any home where anybody could could work it because every department shows up and sure. has to get all their buttons on yeah, and it's yeah. just a cluster 
But Google and Apple are companies that say, no, the, the customer comes first. Sure. And we're not going to confuse them with all. We're going to make a user interface. I mean, if you yeah. have to explain your user interface, well, it ain't right. And I think the customer should not well, have to. I think. Now, there is now a let's difference look at our we, Now that, we're talking controversy. There you go. Our customer, don't forget, 48% of the people don't show up. No, in this whole United States, we, how many people don't even go to the dentist? So this is a customer that's not even there, whether you're a DMD or a DDS or a D RDH. They're not coming. We need to look at how do we help the person that's not even showing up? And you know, say DMD, DDS, I mean, to help the customer that's coming already, they're showing up. They may be confused, but they're coming to the dentist. The only person that would say that to you is someone who's already been to the dentist. Well, I went to the dentist and I wasn't sure for my kid whether it should be this or that. I'm more concerned about the person that doesn't show up. And they're not showing up because they don't value dentistry or oral health. And that's a health literacy issue that we haven't touched upon yet. But I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have as a profession. How do we raise that dental IQ so that the mother's demanding dental care for their kid, not just thinking about it? See, I think that's the thing. How do we unlock that 40-something percent that doesn't show up? If we can knock the 48 percent down to 40 percent, 8 percent, you know how many millions of people would be showing up at the dentist that aren't there now? That's what gets me about the ADA, that they're not doing a better job of getting the patient in the door. They do these little cutesy ads. You know, I learned my lesson when I did the anti-tobacco campaign in Arizona years ago, that from, al from the alcohol folks. I said, you know, we were losing a lot of people to drunk driving. And it wasn't the physicians, it wasn't the lawyers or the judges that got society to change. It was the mothers of the victims that formed Mothers Bad. Against Drug Driving. And they got the laws to change. They got people to take notice. We need the moms. I said, wait a second. I don't, my kid doesn't have insurance? No way. My kid's going to have a serious disease? I didn't know that. They don't know. All they hear is this cutesy thing, go see your dentist twice a year, yada, 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 with a little cartoon figure. That ain't it. We got to get down and dirty. We got to show them what this caries looks like, what the, two th what the kid sitting there like this in their third grade class that doesn't want to open his mouth, doesn't want to answer a question that's going to suffer from self-esteem issues for years and years, and it's all because they didn't go to the dentist. We need to change that. Our association needs to change that. We as a profession needs to change that. And to me, that's health literacy. That's where social, that's where text the floss and some of these genie, some of these things that right now, the, you get the public, every, eight, I learned a valuable lesson when I was talking about this, learned about the texting stuff. There's 70 countries in the world that have over 100% cell phone penetration. That means more cell phones than people. You could be the poorest homeless person. I mean, you go on, on a street light in, in Phoenix, every street corner has got someone standing there with a sign. They're holding the sign in one hand, they got their cell phone in the other. We need to take advantage of that. We need to use digital technology to raise the health literacy. You want patients? That'll get patients. You want to get rid of dental disease, oral health issues, periodontal caries, whatever. We need to make it an issue that the people are demanding it. And I think that's what's going to get legislators to move. When all of a sudden the moms show up downtown, not the dentist, that say, I don't want expanded function or I don't want uh, mid-level providers. I want to keep it the way it was. Well, shit, it ain't going to be the way it was. We got to get it people healthy. And I think that's what we need to do. Uh, this Sorry, is that, no, I love your rants. I love your passion. I, I wish I could bottle it and drink it for breakfast. Uh, let, let me ask you another huge sure. controversy. Um, <clears throat> when you go to the 20 richest countries in the world, they all have a universal health care single payer Absolutely. system. Absolutely. I mean, name them. Canada, Australia. I Look mean, at just, Finland, Sweden, the I Scandinavia. Know, it's them, unbelievable. All of them. Do you think um, America is headed? Do you think America should have should have two separate things? One's universal health care, one single payer system. Do you think America should have one, yes. two, both? Yes. You, you know you, what I you know the you, you know real, the, you, you know, realize all those male lay, Republicans uh, folks, are now I gotta uh, tell you, flipping you off. And you know, screaming. no, that's okay. And the reason I say it, <laughs> you know, I don't want health health insurance. Health insurance is a for profit business. Whenever you have a for profit business controlling health care, it's not the people that come first, it's the bottom line, it's the board of trustees. It's not about health, it's about how do we make money. And I think that's the wrong priority when it comes to health care. I'm a capitalist. 
You know, I, I, I run a not-for-profit school, but people know no margins, no mission. I can't do the good stuff I do unless my clinic is in the black. So I get it. I'm all in. Some of my dearest friends are CEOs of billion-dollar companies. I get it. But the reality is we need to have a system that health is the priority, not the profit. Let them make, we can make money on a lot of different things, but not health insurance because the decision process. It, Aetna it's, just dropped Obamacare. Yeah. So, well, so, so, do you, uh, so, but so how do you think we'll see it in our lifetimes? No. We won't see it in our lifetimes, I don't think. That, so, you know, that saying we live 30 years? Maybe, well, maybe 30. If I live to be 100, I'll be 71 in a couple of months. So and if I look, look good, man. <laughs> for an old fart. No, I'm you, doing you right. look amazing. You, I mean, you work out every I work, day. Not every, I work, yeah, a couple, three nights a week. Three nights a week. And I have a young wife. You have a young wife? <laughs> How much younger is your wife? 17 years. And she's retired. Okay. What did I do wrong? Let's <laughs> well, see. I'm 54. I took out. My wife is 53. A, uh, My wife is 53. She. How much younger is she? 17. I'm 70. She's 53. Okay, so I'm 54 minus 17. So I need to put an ad on. I tried to put an ad on Plenty of Fish, and they denied it. They said, "Dude, you're a whale." <laughs> and uh, so they, they kicked me off. So uh, mine would be 37. Well, huh? well, That's the secret to your. The fun thing is the looks. interview process. Go through the. You got to do yeah. the, the interviews are fun. Um, but anyway, I believe single pay is the right answer when it comes to health care. But whether or not it'll happen, I don't know. I think people are afraid of it because people are angry with government. And I think when you're angry with government... Why that, do you think they're so angry this Because election? Congress really blew it the last eight years. Everybody's blaming Obama. And listen, he may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but when you have a president that everything he presents to Congress, they overturn and say no. They didn't pass one thing in eight years. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's not right. Congress yeah. has an 11% approval rate. I mean, it's right. Like Idi Amin or installing yeah, I mean, his well, that Well, ask that. Trump. Putin's got a higher rating than that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know. It makes me crazy. And I think, I, it's, I get it that Americans are angry. And we have reasons to be angry. But I think we have to direct it in a way that's going to make us better. I'm disappointed politically where we are, you know, with the candidates and so on. But I don't know, you know, my definition of politics, you know, Ticks are blood-sucking animals, and poly means many. Yeah, it's, that, that's, uh, You know, to me, we it, could do better. We need to do better. You would just think that the greatest country on earth with a third of a billion best, people, we'd be, our choices would be I'm voting little, between Wonder Woman and it, Batman. Yeah, where are, the, where are the, the states, men and women, the Lincolns, the, you know, the Jeffersons, the Margaret Meads, you know, the women, I mean, men or women, whatever it may be, where are they? I, I mean, I think part of it, and we're digressing quite a bit, it needs to be publicly funded candidates. If someone wants to run for president, you give them $10 million, you run for president, that's all you get, no private money. It's a fund that we put together so everybody's on the same playing field, the same number, and you sell yourself to the American people. I'm not into this thing where more money wins. You got, it's, it's about who you are. And I think we've got to own that as a, as a public responsibility that our people running for office are not you know, discriminated based on wealth. Well, There's too many well, good you, people you, that can't run. I know you're busy, you promised you one hour. I only got three minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna okay, ask go. you the most the last and the most controversial question on Dentistry Uncensored. Yes. Lots of your critics, uh, dental school deans, yes. say um, you're opening up way too many schools. Nonsense. They're way too expensive, and the kids are yes. walking out with way too much student loan debt. No to the first, yes to the second. There's yes. three. Yeah, three. Uh, uh, you're three, yes, schools. yes, yes. No, yes, yes. <laughs> there are not too many schools because uh, we need debt. We need more dentists. Anybody who thinks there isn't a shortage of dentists hasn't really looked at the real numbers and looked at the trends now that the economy is getting better, that dentists are going to retire, and there's going to be more shortages, particularly for the underserved and so on. The debt is too high. Dental education costs way too much. It costs a lot more to educate a dentist than it does to educate a physician. A medical school can send them to the hospitals, and they pay for all their education. I've got to run an outpatient clinic. You know, uh, that's very expensive. I got to pay dental faculty that are very expensive. So I try not to put it on the backs of students. I, I reduce tuition in the later years because it cost me less in the fourth year. So I, I, I pass it on to the students. But nonetheless, you're absolutely right. It is too expensive and it is too much debt. We need to have better loan repayment pra payment, uh, programs. I believe that if a dentist sees X percent of Medicaid patients that they get their loans forgi certain loans forgiven. 
we can do it in a way that they don't have to go work in community health centers, they don't have to go on an Indian reservation, they could do it in their private practice just by, the, you see a certain special needs, you don't want to mix this population in, we got the cat in the way, if you don't want to mix the, the, these patients in with your patients for whatever reason, do it in the evening, do it on a time, schedule, block off some time just for the Medicaid or just for special needs and you should get some relief on your student loans. I think that's something we could do. We need to be more innovative in our loan repayment, uh, and we got to help the dental schools to reduce costs because it is it costs way too much to educate a dentist. And I don't think we're, they're getting the the quality of the education they should in a number of places. But that's a story for another day. You know what's the most ironic thing about you and I liking that cat is when they start. You know, first they did the uh, sequencing of the human DNA. Yes. And now they've gone off into all these different bacteria. Yes. Well, when they did Streptococcus mutans. Yes. It was like five years later, someone was doing uh, cats, and they realized, because permutations uh, are a constant over time, kind of like radioactive uh, decaying carbon. Anyway, long story short, um, Streptococcus mutans jumped into humans from cats 15,000 years ago wow. in the Fertile Crescent. So we, you know, we picked up, uh, you know, every STD came from an animal, gonorrhea and uh, syphilis wow. from mm -hmm. cattle and sheep, um, AIDS was from a green monkey, but we're dentists. And that bug, Streptococcus mutans, came from those damn cats. Those damn cats. So maybe we should just eat Tigger tonight. What do you there think? There you go. Let's do Prepare it. for dinner. All right, know? little sushi cat. Hey, Jack. What seriously. a pleasure. And Thank I, you. I, I, and I, and I also I just want to say, I, I remember when I opened up in 87, sometimes I'd, I'd have some far out weird question about whatever, whatever. It could be macro epidemiology. And I'd talk to my oral surgeon, Enidonis, and it was always the same thing. You know, I have no idea. You ought to call Dillenberg. He'll know. Because if Dillenberg doesn't know, that was back before computers, he's got a Rolodex this long. So, I, mean, I remember going into your office, asking you a question, you said, I don't know, that's a good question. And then you're filling your cards. Two minutes later, you're talking to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you I, you have the biggest Rolodex in all of dentistry. Yeah, well, that's very sweet. And you've been my uh, role model mm -hmm. idol since uh, 1987. Well, I'm honored by that, and I'm delighted to uh, have a chance to visit with your colleagues around the world, around They're the country. They're just my homies. Yeah, your homies. I love it, and I hope... Uh, what I've shared with you has been informative, helpful, and I just wish all of you great success in realizing your dream and uh, making a difference in a positive way in people's and your patients' lives. And I'll give you one life lesson. If there's anything you heard Jack say that you didn't uh, agree with, uh, take it from me, listen to him for 30 years. Every time I ever disagreed with Jack, it was just a matter of time. Maybe it was three years, five years, ten years. I said, oh, he is right. <laughs> so, great to see you. Thank you, my good friend. Good to see you, buddy. Great to see you. Thank you all.